welcome every single location that is watching around the world. Welcome. Welcome. It is so, so good that you are joining us today. We are filming all the way in India. Come on. And we have a load of lions that are roaring with you today. And so we are so excited. I thought that we could get ourselves into a lion vibe as we start the Lionheart series, right? Let's start talking about lions, thinking about lions. I mean, some of you, you might even start dreaming about lions on the back of this. But I thought we, I could give you some, some lion facts, a bit of lion info before we start today's message. And I thought a, bit, a great place to start when talking about lions is actually how they're brought up. Come on. Let, let's start at their origin, right? And I don't know if you knew this, but uh, for a lion from ages one to two, they are weaned and looked after by their mother, like most mammals. Then from ages two to three, they go and they learn what it means to hunt. And then finally, from ages three to four, they become fully grown. They become fully grown. And for me, I was like, okay, that's interesting, that's cool. Maybe we look a little bit deeper into this. And from ages two to three, as they go on hunting, it's kind of a little bit of an odd season because what actually happens is, is that the entire pride actually kick out the lion cubs and they have to go and fend for themselves. They have to go into the wilderness and they have to learn what it means to, uh, to eat, to kill, to survive, to live for themselves. And if they make it, the, the idea is that they would come back stronger, more mature. And then finally, when they make it back, they would make it uh, to become the leader of the pride. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? But even furthermore, what's really fascinating to me is that when I, when I did some research, only one in eight lion cubs make it back. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That only one in eight lion cubs make it back. Now, the reason for this is because either they starve, or they get eaten, or they give up. But somewhere along the line, the lion cubs do not make it and become the leader of the pride. And this got me thinking, because I don't want to make too many correlations. I think that would be a little bit unfair. But I feel like there is something within us as Christians that are like lion cubs. And that God desires for us to uh, grow into the fullness of what he has for us. To finish the race and to become all that he has called us to become. But if I'm honest, sometimes it feels like that only one in eight Christians actually make it to the fullness of what God has for them. That only one in eight go through the process of being developed and go on the journey of becoming the lion that God has really called us to become. And so I called this message, the making of a lion. The making of a lion. I want to talk to you today about the making of a lion. Because there are things here that I believe that God wants to talk to us about. Why? Because becoming a lion is not inevitable. Because actually lions are made. Yeah. Lions are made. They don't just come out and are born. Actually, there is a developing process you need to go on to actually become a lion. They are developed. And what I want us to realize today is that actually we need to be developed as well. We need to go on this same journey and process to become who God has called us to become as well. And when you go on this, when I go on this process, actually whatever comes in our life, we begin to realize that actually God is using it to make something out of me. God is using it to make, it, uh, make us into something greater than we could imagine. And so if lion cubs do not go through the process of the wilderness, if you and I do not go through the process of the wilderness, then we will not become the lions that God has called us to become. Come on, so good. And so for me, when I grew up, I loved playing football. And I loved playing football because, number one, I was quite good at it. But also, the reason I played football was because I didn't like rugby. I know, just being honest with you. And the reason I didn't like rugby, number one, is because our school was so small, we couldn't get enough boys to, to actually make a team. How sad is that? But more than that, the real reason I... That was my excuse. The real reason 
that I didn't want to play rugby is because there's a lot of, if, if you've ever seen the game, maybe Google it uh, later, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of punches, there's a lot of stuff that you have to go through to be a rugby player. And I thought to myself, I'd rather avoid the pain. I'd rather avoid the pain. And the reason I tell you that is because um, there wasn't always a lion heart that I had. That actually there was a seed of something within me, but it was only until I went on the journey of actually confronting pain that actually God began to develop this within me. Because if, if we're really honest, we all go into a lot of pain trying to avoid pain. Don't we? It's like, oh, if, do I really have to go through that? And you might think it's funny that I wouldn't go through rugby, but for every single one of us, we all try and avoid pain in different ways, don't we? Yeah. Whether it's the, uh, the pain of confrontation, the pain of confronting our own sin or in somebody else or in ourselves, even more importantly, we all have to go on the pain of this, don't we? But what I want you to know, and what I've learned from my own story is that there is a lion inside every single one of us. And there is a lion inside of you as well. So wherever you're watching this, I don't know what you're or where you're listening to this message, I want to let you know today that there is a lion with inside of you. And God desires today to bring it and pull it out of you like never before. And so I want to start by reading to you a scripture in Luke chapter 9 verse 51. And it says here, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out to Jerusalem. Now for you as you're reading this, this might sound like a standard scripture. But what we've got to realize is that this is the beginning stage of Jesus' journey towards Golgotha where he's going to die on the cross. This is the beginning stage of Jesus' utmost mission. And he knows what he's about to go through because he was sent by God to die for all of mankind. And he knew what he was about to go through. He knew that he was about to be spat on, mocked, whipped, beaten, and eventually die for you and I. He knew what you and I were going to cost him. And that was his own life. And so right from the get-go, Jesus resolutely set out to endure what he was about to go through. And so before we start anywhere else, you know I've got to know, this is our Jesus. And this is the Lionheart. This is the Lionheart on display right here. And you've got to know that if that same heart is in Jesus, then that same heart is in you as well. That same heart is in you as well. That Lionheart. But it has to be developed. It has to be developed. And so what I'm going to talk through with you today is four things. Four things that you and I need to help us become a lion. The making of a lion. And if I'm honest, these are four things that God has uh, absolutely done within my life that I felt God was saying, these are the things that I want to speak to Freedom Church to develop the lion heart within you. So all of these things are, are things that God has been teaching me and training me in. And let me tell you, I am so grateful for them. And also with these four things, the lessons haven't finished. They're just continuing. And so I want to talk with you the four things of making a lion. And so the first one, if you can write this down, is resolve. The first thing of making a lion is resolve. Did you see in that scripture the word resolutely? The word resolutely and resolve, they're from the same Latin word, which means to be loosened and to have paid and set free. Is that not what Jesus did for us? He loosened our chains, he paid our debts, and he set us free. That is the power of a resolute decision. Think about this. That is the power of your resolute decision. When you decide and say, do you know what, I'm going to go all for it. I'm going to endure whatever it takes. It actually unlocks more within you than if you stayed on the bench and stayed where you are. Every single one of us, for the making of a lion, requires resolve. Because resolve is this incredible quality to make up its mind. This is what I'm going to do. And this is what we need as a church. Because what you see with Jesus, he's saying, no matter what, no matter what comes my way, 
Whatever they say about me, whatever they do about me, whatever my situation, I'm going to keep going because I've made a resolute decision within my mind to finish. You see, the church was designed not to be a place of half-hearted decisions, but of resolute decisions. And God's heart for you is that you would have resolve, not dissolve. For some of us, we just dissolve when things get tough. But God is saying, I want to build not a spaghetti spine, but a backbone within you that says resolve within your heart. Can you imagine what our world would look like if Christians today came with a resolute decision? I believe that our church and our world would be a powerful place. Full of resolute decision. Not a place where we tap out or give up halfway, but we finish to the end. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you've noticed it, but if you ever asked God, build more resolve within me, it usually comes about through needing a resolution. And it's kind of difficult. It's like, ooh, I prayed for it, but now God is actually manufacturing situations where I'm going to need it. It's like, when you, it's like when you pray for faith, and then God gives you environments where you need more faith. Yeah. Or you pray for patience, it's like, here's a scenario where you need patience. <laughs> have, you, have you ever noticed that God does this? Yeah. And you might be thinking, man, that's, that's painful. Is it worth it? Right. Yeah. Is, it, is, it is it really worthwhile to have to go through this pain, Jesus? Mm-hmm. Imagine the echo that you receive wow. when you make it into heaven. And you say, do you know what? I kept the faith. I kept going. I didn't give up. I didn't stop. I made it to the end. Can you imagine the cheer that you would receive in heaven? That is what God desires for you and I. But the only thing is, is that we need to live a life that's worth applauding. We need to live a life that says, Jesus, I'll give you everything now. Even if I don't get applauds now, because I know that there is a crown that is so much better for me in heaven. Because, let's be honest, we know some people with resolve. Why? Because they're really annoying. (laughs) It's like they won't go away. It's like they're just always there. They just won't stop. They just keep coming. They get knocked down and they get back up again. So nothing will stop them. So my goodness, what is it about this person, this grit, this tenacity? They just keep going. You can't stop them. But what I want you to know today is that resolve isn't without feeling. It's not just this, uh, I don't feel anything. Actually, what I've discovered in my own life is that it's actually when I feel the most is when it matters the most. When I feel it the most is when I actually need the most resolve within me to keep going and to keep fighting. And so in the years of church planting, what I've discovered is that actually, if I'm honest, I've needed the resolve more than ever before. And often it comes between two decisions. I've got to make a decision between what is easy and what is right. Yes. Come on. Am I going to choose the narrow path? Am I going to choose the harder path? Am I going to choose the path that is less trodden upon? And God is saying, if you choose not what is easy, but what is right, that is when you choose resolve. Yes. And when I've done this, what I've realized is that it then becomes incomparably worthwhile. I'm so glad that I didn't give up. I'm so glad that I didn't tap out too soon and I chose what is right rather than what is easy. You see, a man named Robert Goddard, he said, the reason many people fall is not for the lack of vision, but for the lack of resolve. And that got me really thinking because it's like we can have so much vision, can't we? But unless we have the resolve to complete it, then we'll never actually get there in the end anyway. And then he says, and resolve is out of counting the cost. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this Freedom Church is because this is the smallest we are ever going to be. This is the smallest we're ever going to be. And heck, let's pray. This is the smallest your life is ever going to be. This is the smallest because God wants to do great, big, and mighty things. But unless we count the cost and get a resolve within us now... God doesn't want us to tap out early. He wants us to keep serving, keep worshiping, keep turning up, keep going, keep giving it everything that you've got. 
Because when you do that and you have this resolve, it's like obstacles don't phase you anymore. That's what, that's what Soph and I have discovered nowadays. Obstacles don't really phase us anymore because we already made the decision to finish. Yeah. I already made the decision. So keep coming at me, whatever you've got, because there is a resolve within me. Resolve means expecting opposition. It means standing strong in the face of adversity. And to regard these difficulties as worthwhile. Because we understand the bigger picture of what we're running towards. Freedom Church, Lions of Freedom Church, we need this more than ever before. And so just as Jesus resolutely, it says, it set, he set his face. And that's out of Isaiah chapter 50 where it says that they tore a beard hair out of his chin. They whipped him. They mocked him. They spat on him. And yet he set his face like flint. And that is the manner to which Jesus approached Jerusalem. And that is the same manner that's within you as well. So I want you to say to the person next to you, resolve, don't dissolve. Resolve, Resolve, Resolve. don't dissolve. Resolve, Resolve. Resolve. don't dissolve. (laughs) And so the second making of a lion, the first one is resolve. The second making of a lion is forging. Forging. Why? Because lions are forged, not found. And we've got to understand that reaching the fullness of what God has for us is going to require forging. You see, today what I'm doing is I'm increasing your capacity to keep going and not to quit. You see, in Isaiah 54 verse 16, it says, See, it is I who created the, the blacksmith who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its purpose. So when you allow yourself to be forged, he will create you as a sword. You've got to understand that this forging process is necessary for the work and purpose that God has for you. So what is forging? Forging is when you get a big chunk of metal And you burn it up really hot, white hot. You can't even touch it. And then you put it on an anvil and the blacksmith will get a hammer and he hits it and he bashes it and he thumps it and he hits it. And with every hit, he removes impurities out of the steel. And as he hits it, he begins to craft and to cultivate and to shape this chunk of metal into a sword. And with every hit, it begins to manufacture into its original purpose. And this is the forging that God desires to do within every single one of us. So that means that with every season, with every trial, with everything that you and I go through, actually God is bringing things to the surface, not so that he can harm us, but so that he can make us better And he can use us for for his purposes. You may have heard it said that it's either make or break. You heard that saying, it's either make or break. What I want to say to you today is that the breaking of you is the making of you. The breaking of you is the making of you. A chunk of metal cannot do much, but a sword can do mighty things. Will you allow him to forge within you? What if you were praying away the very thing that God intended to use to grow you? God, I don't want to do this anymore. That's from the enemy. What if it's from God? God say, I want to use this thing to grow you to Freedom Church. Would you allow me to forge the lion heart within you? For me, I think that this is a universal reference. Has anyone noticed the difference between the firstborn and the lastborn? I'm sure this crosses culture. Because, take it from someone who knows, the firstborn is like you're a prisoner of war. Has anyone ever noticed this? It's like you have routine, you have schedule, this is when you go to bed, this is when you go to sleep, this is when you have to eat. It's like, this is my routine, and when I say you're doing this, you are doing this. And then all of a sudden, the last born comes along, and they can get away with a lot. Yeah, we got some, we got some hands up in the room here today. And it's like, I was never allowed to get away with that. What do you mean? Yeah? Has is is anyone else ever experienced this? 
Yeah. All of the last borns are saying, I've no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And remember how I told you how I wanted to avoid pain in rugby? Well, I want to use this as an example of something that literally destroyed the pain, the, the, the desire to not want to take pain. And, and for me, this is an example that my parents use, and I just want to honor them. Because of their parenting, I am where I am today. And because of this lesson, it actually forged something significant within me. And it's how you handle no. Because for me as a child, and I would say, hey, can, can I watch that other cartoon that I didn't really need to watch? And my parents would say no. Or if I asked for that toy that I didn't really need, or um, maybe I wanted to go hang out with my friends for a little bit longer. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes my parents would say no. And at this no, for me, was utter destruction. <laughs> because when they said no, I was like, what? <laughs> Why? And then they would say, no. And I would say, why? And they would say, no. And I would say, why? And with every why, it was like this excruciating pain within me. And then finally I'd say, why? And then they'd say, because? Because? What do you mean, because? I'd say, because, because, because. And then finally my dad would say, because that's life. <laughs> because that's life? What are you talking about? Because that's life. I'm three years old. I don't know what life is. Because that's life. Because that's life. And at the time, I didn't know. But because that which was, or what used to be excruciating for me, is now valuable to me. Do you know why? Because now I can handle no. Now, whatever comes in my life, it doesn't really matter to me. I don't even need a why or an explanation. When something tough comes, I can just keep going. And there is something that was carved and created within me that I don't need an explanation. I'm okay with a no. I'm just going to keep on going. And for some of us, we've stopped because we received a no. And, and it's like, God, why? What? And the reason we stop is because we start questioning the motive of the Father. The reason why I could receive a no was because I trusted that my dad loved me and that he had my best interest in mind. And for some of us, we've stopped along the way. It's like, God, really? Why? Why would you do that? And we start questioning the motive of the Father, but God is saying, no, 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 no. Would you just allow me to forge character within you? Would you just allow me to create something of depth within you? You see, for some of us, we really have got stuck in no. Yeah. And we got disillusioned or frustrated. We don't know where to turn. But for me now, God's taught something within me that if you receive a no, you just keep going. Yeah. If you can't get through it, you go over it. If you can't go over it, you go under it. If you can't go under it, you'll go around it. But let me tell you, I'm going to keep on going. Yeah. I'm going to just keep on going. Why? Because I can handle no. Yeah. And so for some of us, we actually need innovation within our lives. Because for some of us, innovation stops at no, but that's where it begins. You'll start thinking, say, no, there's, there's actually more that God has for me. I need to think beyond. And with the word innovation, it's not Greek, it's not Latin, but think about the first four letters of innovation. It's inno. Wow. What's innovation? It's what you do in the no. It's what you do in the no that says, I won't allow any obstacle get in my way because I'm going to innovate my way out of it because he who is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And so God is crafting you into something so much stronger, so much more powerful than you can realize. And how you allow God to forge you matters because it is the making of a lion. Number three, the third part of making a lion is waiting. Waiting. Don't know if you've noticed this, but we live in an instant world. Instant coffee, instant noodles. If the fast food isn't fast enough, I'm going to complain. We love on-demand TV. We love self-service, self-check-in and out. Our self-check-out. And our life is around this instantaneous society. And that's okay. I love it. That, that helps my life. Thank you, Lord, for technology. But it's fine until it affects our theology. Wow. 
is fine until it affects our experience of God and how we handle life. Because what if, like, we love instant, but what if God isn't as instant as we'd like him to be? What if God doesn't show up in the way that we wanted him to? Do we crash and we put in a complaint to customer services or do we keep going and allow the waiting season to do something significant within our lives? I've got news for you today. This may not be Burger King and you don't always get to have it your way. You don't always get to have it your way. And so this feed me now culture means that we're no longer prepared to wait. But the truth is, is that good things take time. Good things take time. You think about Abraham, he prayed for a son, but it didn't take until 25 years for him to receive his son. David was appointed king, but it took 15 years for him to become king. Joseph received a dream, but it wasn't until 14 years later when it actually came to fulfillment. Jesus was sent on a mission, but it wasn't until age 33 that he actually completed it. We've got to understand that there is a process that is going on. And if we forfeit the process, then we forfeit the fullness of what God has for us. God allows patience to complete its perfect work within us. And so every location, I want you to look up the scripture in your Bibles. It's James chapter 1 verse 4. And it says, let patience, let patience Finish its work within you so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. God desires for you and I to be mature, to be complete, to not lack anything and to experience the fullness of what he has. But in order to do that, we need to allow waiting to form character within us. And so God said to me, Luke, on your first Sunday, will you celebrate when you just have two people? Luke, will you celebrate when you have no money? Will you celebrate when things get tough and things get hard? Because it's in those moments when you have nothing that you actually explore that you have everything if you allow patience to do its work. Because what happens in the waiting is either we get bored or the appeal of something better comes along. Have you noticed this? Oh, it's so dangerous. This is potent. Because the appealing of something better comes along. Maybe for you, it's a better relationship or a better church or a better dream. And the appeal of something better comes in. And what we do, we actually forfeit what God originally intended for us because we weren't allowed to wait, allow ourselves to wait and allow patience to complete its work within us. There are some people here today who desire to tap out early. And God is saying, would you wait? Would you wait for what I have for you? Why? Because half-baked goods are no good at all. And if we do not allow this, what we end up having is a load of lion cubs in lion bodies. And the church needs to rise up with a maturity of saying, I trust in my God and he will complete it in its time. We've got to learn that lions are made through adversity, obscurity and ambiguity. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but through the waiting... I've got to understand it. it doesn't all make sense yet, but through the waiting, you will see your God come through. Amen? Amen. 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 So, my final thought on waiting is that for some of us, perhaps the most faith-filled thing we could do, the most daring thing we could do, is actually to remain faithful in where God has called us to be planted. That rather than uplifting uprooting, leaving, but in the waiting, committing to where God has called us to be, God will do that work in his time. And so as we close, the fourth and final part I'm going to share with you today, and I'm going to invite up the band to play, but just remember, the first making of a lion is resolve. The second making is, what is it? Forging. Forging. The third is Waiting. waiting, if you heard that on camera, and the fourth is finishing. Finishing. The making of a lion requires finishing. And what I want to do today is I want to minister to some people who felt like giving up. I want to minister to some people who felt like quitting. Because it is in you to finish. And so I want to share with you a scripture. And it's in Luke chapter 22, verse 39 to 42. 
And right at the beginning, you remember that we started Jesus' journey towards the cross. And now we find ourselves towards the end. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 39 to 42, it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Then he withdrew without a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed. And this is what he prayed. He said, Father, if you are willing, if you are willing, take this cup from me. If you are willing, take this cup from me. But if not, yet not my will, but yours be done. And so we find Jesus right towards the end. And he knows what he's about to go through. He knows it. And there's something within him that's saying, God, if you're willing, would you take this cup from me? I'm not sure if I could do this. And for some people that might seem strange, but what we've got to realize is that Jesus is God. He is perfect. And yet whilst he's in man's body, he is going through every trial, every temptation known to mankind. So that when he says it is finished on the cross, not only is it finished for him, but it's finished for you. It's finished for you. And so he's going through this. He's saying, Lord, if it is your will, would you take this cup from me? And we've got to understand here what's happening is Jesus is fighting the urge to quit. He's fighting the urge to quit. And he's saying, Dad, I want to throw the towel in. Dad, I'm not sure that I could go through with this. Could you just send an angel or a horse or a camel? I'd much rather live than die. I'm not sure I can go through with this. And Jesus, he's fighting the urge to quit. Is there anybody here today who knows what it feels like to fight the urge to quit? I've got to be honest with you. I fought that a lot more times than I'd cared to dream to say. I fought the urge to quit a lot. But someone once said, if you're not bricking it, then you're not living it. What I'm saying is, is that it's okay to feel like quitting. But actually, it's what we do with that that matters. Because what Jesus was saying is, Lord, I'm not sure if I could get through this. When things get tough and things get hard, the easiest thing to do is leave. Let me tell you. And through the years of church planting, you turn around and you think, where the heck are they? And you remember, it's only one in eight that make it. Sometimes it makes you think, where are the other seven out of eight? Where have they gone? Why didn't they just stay? It's because it's easy to leave. But you want to realize that you have to go through the process. Go on the journey through the developing so that you can inherit the fullness. So don't quit. And so Jesus is there. He's saying, Lord, I can't do this anymore. It's hard being me. Can I be someone else? I don't think I can do this anymore. And yet he musters up the courage within him to say, but yet, not my will, but your will be done. And so what he's saying there, he's saying, Lord, not my preference, but yours be done. Lord, not my way, but your way be done. Lord, this may not have been what I wanted. I may not have even planned this for my life, but yours be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Because there is a resolve, there is a fighting. I've waited till this moment, and I'm going to forge forward. Not my will, but your will be done. And so as we close, I want to share a story with you of a man named Derek Redmond. And Derek Redmond was an Olympian who uh, ran in the 400 meter sprint in Barcelona in 1992. And he was a great runner. In fact, many people couldn't believe that he actually made it to the Olympic stage. And he'd done so well. Man, he did so well to get there that people actually considered and thought, hey, do you know what? This guy could win the medal. This guy, he could go all the way. And so Derek Redmond, he turns up with his posse and he's got his kit on with the flappy shorts 
and, and, and he gets down on, on the track, waiting for the gun to start. And the gun sounds. Thousands of people in the crowd watching Derek Redmond. Millions of people watching around the world, watching this one moment. And as he runs, and he runs, the crowd begins to roar. And 150 meters in, he's running, and he's running, and he's going real fast. He starts taking over people, boom, 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 and he's running, and he's running, and he's running, and people are watching all eyes, and they track him, and they track him, and they track him, and then boom, and he pulls his hamstring. And there he is, he's on the floor, and he doesn't know what to do. This has taken decades, decades for him to get here. And there he is on the floor, whilst the other competitors are running past him. And the crowd goes silent. And they watch in short terror. What on earth has happened? He, he fell at the last hurdle. How could it be? And so then the, the, the paramedics and the stretcher, they come along and then they go to pick up Derek Redmond. And what he does is, is his dad is in the crowd. And because his dad is watching, he starts to get up. And he pushes the paramedics out the way. He says, get out of my way, get out of my way. And the race has already finished by now. And people are watching. And he doesn't know what to do with himself, but there's just one thing that he knows is he just keeps moving forward. And he keeps going and he keeps going. And there's tears down his eyes and he's crying. And he's saying, well, I've got to, just got to keep going. And he almost falls down. And then this man from the crowd runs forward and it's his dad. And his dad comes along and he puts his arm around him and he carries him. He literally pulls him to the finish line and he's saying, this is my son. I made my son to be a finisher. Get out of the way. Don't stop him. Keep going. And he dragged him towards the finish line. And I want to tell some people today that your dad is here and he wants to carry you to the finish line because you are not a quitter. You are a lion. And there are some people you need to know that for some of you, it's not even about winning, it's about finishing. He didn't even run for them, he ran for himself. And he said, I don't even need the appreciation, I don't even need the honor, I don't even need the medal, but I've just got to keep going because my dad is watching and he's carrying me the whole way and I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish what I started. I'm going to finish because my dad is with me. You see, lions don't quit. And you are not a quitter.